This national park is located at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. It's a difficult place to get to. To get to the island you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jackson Arbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it has had an interesting history. In the early 1600s it was inhabited by a tribe of Potawatomi Native Americans as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups did not trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence, but for the most part they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s the Potawatomi had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after the Potawatomi had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They seemed to be more white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers, or even find where they were living. It was around this time that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals, it's not mentioned what they were, maybe it was pigs or chickens kept by the settlers were found slaughtered in the village and seemed to have been used to make markings in blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island, and they intended to find them, but after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found a single person. These strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search and none of the other settlers were ever seen again. In 1836 the Potawatomi Lighthouse was built on the northern part of the island. After construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and dwelling are made, are of the best quality and that the work is done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through cracks leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was completely alone most of the time at the lighthouse and some have said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was acting strange. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by years of solitude and thought it would be best that he spend some time away from the island. In 1852 Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December in the lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. The next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper say that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks except on January 20, 1876. The keeper at the time named Betts reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later on May 3, 1876 Betts wrote the two men who were lost last January have been seen several times once from Connie Lighthouse and once from Jackson Port. The men were apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account they were still adrift. There is not much hope that they will be found and buried. By 1900 most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. In 1910 a successful business owner and inventor, Chester Thordarson purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. Thordarson is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island he built a giant stone hall that has a boathouse on the lower level. A stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, 
and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. The Great Hall was used to store Thordarson's immense book collection. He had over 11,000 books and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection. Thordarson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, though some have speculated that he saw something that actually scared him to death. I couldn't find any writings from Thordarson however that mentioned him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to the University of Wisconsin-Madison providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thordarson's personal papers are housed in the archives section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. All of this history I gave is just to provide a little context for experiences I have had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021 I took my first, and last, trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides, I arrived on the island at about 2 p.m. I had booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time hiking out to the site to enjoy the scenery and took a couple breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking. I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated, and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my site, I heard a single high-pitched squeal noise coming from the forest. It didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped in my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site. When I got back, I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D, and E are grouped together, but there's probably 100 yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path. As I was setting some sticks up in my fire ring, something caught my eye and I looked up. Fairly far away, it looked like it might have been at Site D or a little further, was a person running in my direction. My first thought was well that's odd, because like I said it's not even really a trail they were on, then my mind just went to there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose grey clothes, maybe in a hoodie. It was still far enough away that I couldn't really make out any details. I quickly stood up from the crouching position I was in and just as I did I heard that high-pitched squeal noise again. It was behind me, and it was much closer this time. This startled me quite a bit so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple seconds, but didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around because I knew the running person must be getting close, but now they were gone. Again, I stood there and scanned the trees, but did not see them anywhere. I was so confused I was kind of frozen for a few seconds. It was all very strange, but I was able to reason it out in my head that it was just a fellow camper from Site C or D that was maybe running to the pit toilet that was a couple hundred yards west of the sites. I tried to forget about it, but it was really just bothering me. I did not like whatever that squeal noise was, and I just felt strange. With some effort I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple adult beverages then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen Site C or D yet so I thought I would check those out and see if I did have some neighbors camping nearby. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet so that made me feel a little less uneasy about the runner. I figured it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D. It didn't make a ton of sense because I probably still should have seen them, but it made me feel better. I continued on to Site C and saw there was a tent set up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site and there was a couple sitting at the picnic table. Neither of them looked like they would have been the person I saw running. I introduced myself, and they introduced themselves. They were probably in their mid-thirties, they were very nice, and both seemed to be pretty drunk, but a quiet drunk. I didn't ask about the runner, or the squealing noises because I thought it might be weird. 
I wished them a good night and walked back to my tent. When I got back I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at millions of stars. I felt better about everything from earlier and felt stupid about the whole thing and decided to get some sleep. It was a long day so I fell asleep almost immediately. At around 2.30 am. I woke up by a huge boom of thunder. It started down pouring. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped. I love camping in the rain, but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and lightning. I did not feel good about being out there in a tent and felt very exposed. The storm lasted for about an hour before it became just a light steady drizzle. I was just starting to fall back asleep when I heard the squeal noise again. I opened my eyes up wide in the dark and just laid there silent. There was another louder squeal noise and it was pretty close. I knew there are no real dangerous animals on Lock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bear or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better though. There was just something about that squeal that I didn't like. I say squeal because that's the best I can describe it. It sounded to me like a pig squeal. I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, but that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or angry pig squeal. I continued to lay in my tent and started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining so the sounds were a little buried in the sound of rain, but it definitely sounded like a somewhat large animal or human walking around. I sat up in my tent and took a knife I had out just to feel better. In my head I just kept saying you know it's just an animal. It's fine. There's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent. I just sat there being still holding my knife for maybe 10 minutes without hearing anything else. I started thinking to myself it's fine. It was just an animal. You're being stupid and you need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down when there was a very loud squeal and it was right outside my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. My heart was beating so hard my entire body was pulsing and I felt it in my ears. It took everything in me but I forced out to get out of here. Not shouting but as stern and mean sounding as I could at that moment. I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps that night, but I also didn't sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually the rain stopped and I kept laying there until the sun came up. All that time reassuring myself that I was being stupid. It was just an animal. It was probably 7 am before I decided I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. As soon as I stepped outside my tent I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was upside down. When I saw this I surprisingly calmly thought okay, this is enough, I'm leaving the island today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind had blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little strange because the table was pretty heavy and I felt like I would have heard the table flipping over, but that might have made sense. I made some cold instant coffee, had a bite to eat, started to feel better about the whole thing, then decided to go for a hike. I admit, I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural. After I had some coffee and food, and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time. The reason I came to the island in the first place was to hike the 7 mile Thordarsons loop trail that has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to start the hike. I packed a few things in my backpack and started off. Fairly close to my site is the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked like someone had recently had a fire in it. A little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. It's believed there are still more buried here in unmarked graves. These likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. The island has three cemeteries. There is one by the beach and that's where Chester Thordarson is buried, there's one on the eastern part of the island where the two sisters are buried, and there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper David E. Corbin is buried. 
There is also at least one Pawani burial area on the island, but no one knows exactly where that is. I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench where I sat down and drank some water. I started to hear some talking on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what language it might have been. Both voices were very, very deep and guttural. Then back deep in the woods I hear a loud and quick you 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 you. Immediately both the voices I was listening to responded with their own oh oh oh. I kind of smiled because it sounded like these two heard whatever it was in the woods and they were trying to be funny and mock it by responding. I got off the bench, put my backpack back on and started walking in the direction further down the trail where the voices were coming from, but I never did find these people. The rest of the hike went very well. I visited the cemetery where David E. Corbin is buried. I took a self-guided tour of the Potawatomi Lighthouse. I passed the wooden gate that apparently used to be part of a larger structure. I walked by the Great Hall and Dock area from where I arrived on the island. Visited some of the other structures on the island. Came across the cemetery where Chester Thordarson is buried. Then finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a very nice hike with a lot to see and wasn't especially difficult, but I was tired. I did walk down to campsite C to ask the couple I spoke with the night before how they did with the storm during the night, but they had packed up and left. I was disappointed because I also really wanted to ask them about the squealing noises during the night. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. I built a fire, made some meals, had a cigar and some drinks. As soon as it got dark I was ready for bed since I had so little sleep the night before. I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly and was immediately fully alert. Nothing that I was aware of caused me to wake up, but I felt something was wrong. I sat up in my tent, and this part is a little hard to explain. A feeling of complete dread washed over me. It was unlike anything I had ever felt before. It felt like there was something in the tent with me, and I could feel that it was angry, seething with anger, rageful even, and I could feel its hatred for me. It felt like something very bad was about to happen, and I couldn't do anything about it. I started to shiver uncontrollably. There was a smell of garbage or rotten meat, and it got stronger and stronger to the point where I wanted to throw up, but couldn't because I was frozen. I had never felt so exposed and helpless. I stared forward at nothing, just frozen, and the weird thing is I accepted whatever was about to happen to me. It was like my brain telling me that whatever is about to happen, even if it's death, will at least be relief. Then I passed out. At least I have to assume I passed out. That's all I remember until I woke up at about 8 a.m. that morning. When I woke up I was laying outside of my sleeping bag, on top of it, and my legs were in an unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back with my left leg straight out, and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart started pounding but I kept thinking to myself it was a dream. I'm leaving right now. It was a dream. I'm leaving right now. I packed up everything very quickly and started back toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island. Since the first boat from Washington Island doesn't arrive until about 10.30 am, I had to kill a little time around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get off that island so bad, but I did feel a little better just being out of the woods and I could see other people. I sat down on a bench a little to the east of the dock and lit a cigar just to give me something to do while trying not to think about the night before. I was sitting a few minutes and scanning out over the water when I was startled by someone behind me saying hi. I jumped and was embarrassed when the person came around saying sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I saw you smoking and just came over to ask if you had a lighter. I felt like an idiot and told him that's fine. I just didn't sleep well last night and was kind of zoned out, and I handed him my lighter. He thanked me, lit a cigarette, then handed the lighter back to me. We started talking about the usual things you might talk about. He said he was from the Madison area. We talked about the storms we've been having. He seemed to be a real outdoorsy kind of guy, and talked about his plans to move to Washington Island. It was a nice normal conversation and kind of took my mind off the night I just had for a little bit. 
he seemed like a pretty nice guy. Then, naturally, he asked me what site I had been staying at. I told him I was staying at site E the last two nights, and he said he usually books that site, but I must have reserved it before him. He said he had booked site D the last two nights. I was surprised by this because no tent or anything was at site D the two times I walked past the site. I told him this and he said he comes to the island a few times a year and you have to book a site, but he actually camps at different areas on the island. I asked him where he camps and he told me most of the time he camps in the East Cemetery, but he also likes to camp in the woods south of the lighthouse. He told me that he hikes about halfway down the Fernwood Trail and just heads north into the woods where he finds a place to camp. He said that one time he found the ruins of a small log house in those woods and he's going to try and find it again and camp inside of it. At this point I started to change my opinion about this guy and wanted to change the subject, but then he asked me if I had heard the screeches in the woods. I took a second to reply and knew he was talking about the squealing I had heard. I told him I had, and asked him if he knew what it was. This time he took a second to reply and I saw his face change. He looked as if he was thinking if he should tell me something. Like a secret. With no expression at all on his face he said matter-of-factly a demon lives on this island. Under any other circumstance I would have laughed this off, but not after what I experienced the night before. He looked at me and must have seen the anxiety and fear I was feeling. He surprised me by letting out a quick laugh. He asked me if I saw anything that night. I told him I hadn't seen anything and he stared at me like he was trying to figure something out. I felt like he could tell I had experienced something. At this point I was ready for the conversation to be over. Then he told me he had seen something in the cemetery that night. Now his face and mood kind of changed again like he was trying to confide in me. I really did not want to ask the question, but I knew he wanted me to ask it. So I asked him what he saw in the cemetery, but my voice was shaky. Then I could tell he had changed his mind about telling me. He actually looked at me with empathy and told me that what he saw was hard to explain, but if I was afraid of the screeching noises he didn't think I should go near the cemetery. I didn't say anything right away, but he said four words without any context. Keepers of the flame. I looked at my cigar and the ash was long. I put it out and told him I was going to wait by the dock for the boat. He nodded and I started to walk away. After a few steps he said hey, and I turned around to look at him. He just said don't come back here. I turned around and started walking again. I don't know if that was a warning or a friendly suggestion, but I took it to heart. I was definitely not coming back to Rock Island. When I got home I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things that he could have been referring to. The name of the Native Americans that lived on the island, the Potawatomi, could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were sometimes referred to as the Keepers of the Flame. Then there was also a 19th century cult that was said to visit the island from time to time that called themselves the Keepers of the Flame. I know that hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year and have a great time camping, hiking the trails and exploring Chester Thordarson's buildings. My humble suggestion is this. Do not go to Rock Island. I went to a friend's house in the Bridgeport area of Harrison County, West Virginia to sight in my new rifle. He began to tell me a story of a strange animal that was killed on this farm by the man who owned it before his death. The farmer was a coon hunter and went out almost every night. One night the farmer's dogs got on a scent and took off. They ran for about an hour and stopped at the base of a tree as usual. The farmer made his way up the hill to the tree to shoot the coon the dogs had cornered. There was nothing there though. Thinking this was very strange he started to look around when he noticed a tree with its limbs shaking. Something was jumping from tree to tree to keep from being seen. The farmer finding this very strange went and told my friend what had happened and dismissed it altogether. About a week later the supposed creature did the same trick. This made the old man suspicious because his dogs were very well trained and had never let him down before. This happened for about a month when one night the dogs treat an animal and the farmer got there quickly and shot it. To his surprise, it was no coon. It had long grayish, brown hair and was about five feet tall. Its hands were human-like and its feet were more hand-like than anything. 
I told my friend he was crazy so he decided to prove it to me. He told me the old man kept the animal but did not have it mounted cause he was afraid he had done something wrong. My friend took me to the old barn and there it was. The old man had nailed its carcass to the wall. I was shocked. It was built a lot like a human and had hair six or seven inches long on it. It had very large sharp teeth and resembled some kind of ape looking creature. I told my friend I wouldn't say anything about it but I feel that it is my duty to report this. If anyone has any idea what this animal could be please let me know. I'm a rancher in Oklahoma. Feral hogs are a problem in this area. I live north of the Red River on the Oklahoma side close to West Cache Creek. One night a friend called me to go pigs hunting with him on one of his friend's fields that is getting destroyed by pigs. Here in Oklahoma it is legal to hunt pigs and coyotes with thermal scopes. Feral pigs are mainly active at night. We rode by the river, then walked possibly 150 yards and set up behind a fallen log. We sat and waited. It was a beautiful calm night and moonlight made visibility excellent even without the thermal. After maybe 30 minutes we heard the screaming. It was very loud we looked at each other, thinking it was a possible cougar, but couldn't tell exactly where it came from. When we heard a pig squeal to our right, in my head I was thinking a big cat caught a pig. I looked through my thermal. I froze. An 8 to 10 foot tall creature had this pig in its hands. It wasn't a small pig, maybe 200 to 250 pounds and it was squealing and fighting the strength and size of this thing. It was amazing. It had a long beard, dog-like snout, and hairy. But in my thermal the images are white, so as far as the color I'm not sure. As I was watching this thing it literally ripped the pig in half with its bare hands, like a sheet of paper, and threw it on the ground. It started walking towards us. I nearly crapped myself. I literally froze. I couldn't pull the trigger. In my mind, I was telling my hand to pull the trigger but I physically couldn't. Then, all of a sudden, a massive log maybe 30 feet long 2 to 3 foot round flew over the top of us. I jumped up and ran. My body was right behind me. We got in my ATV. I started it and held my foot to the floor. We were traveling about 60 miles per hour. It'll run 80 miles per hour, but don't believe it was at top speed yet. We busted through the gate to the pasture. I didn't even have a thought of getting out and opening it. We hit a ditch and went airborne and started to do a front roll thinking this is going to hurt. The next thing I remember we were sitting still, not moving, and not hurt. We were sitting next to my pickup and trailer. What the hell? We loaded it up and went to his house in silence, now a word was said. We pulled up to his house. We went inside. His wife asked, what's wrong with you guys? You look like you've seen a ghost. Where are your guns? I said I think that it can keep the guns. I never even realized our guns were left laying by the stump, but I didn't care. I was glad to be out of there. I live about 40 miles from him. Now, this is the creepiest part. When I parked the truck and walked to my front door I noticed something in my yard. About 20 yards from the front door is that rifle I left down at the river. Holy crap. That thing knows where I live. It's 40 miles away. Nothing has happened since then but I don't go out at dark unless I absolutely have to and haven't been back to that creek or river since. And I don't plan to. But I do feel something unnatural saved us that night. Ever since I was young I have seen a large black wolf, with red eyes. The first encounter I had with it was when I was 12. I was walking home from school in the mid-afternoon and was mostly zoning out. I used to bring my portable CD player to and from school and listen to CDs on my hour-long trek back home so I didn't notice him at first. I had to trek through a large suburban area in order to get to my house on the far side of it from the school but as I'm walking I start to feel uneasy. I begin to look around and spot this wolf who stood as tall as I did at the time, 5 feet, and the only reason this is so ingrained into me is because I remember looking eye to eye with him. I was coming up a hill, and about a block down on the corner of the road he was just standing there staring at me. 
My grandfather was a canine handler, so I have been raised with dogs my whole life. I immediately went into play it safe mode like I would with a large, unfamiliar dog and averted my eyes because I didn't want it to think I was challenging it. My turn was thankfully on my left and the wolf out on my right, so I steadied my pace reminding myself not to run. Running triggers the hunting instinct, and while I was still trying to wrap my head around the absolute massive size of this creature I did my best to keep my eyes downwards but at this point I was turning up my cul-de-sac trying to keep it in view. I kept the paws in my sight as I cut across the road up towards my house. That was when they disappeared. I looked back knowing I shouldn't take my eyes off a stray animal but he wasn't there. I kind of cursed myself mentally at the time. I think I was still in shock from the size that I hadn't processed that it was just a massive wolf in broad daylight. I remember chiding myself as I hurried into my house and closed slash locked the door behind me. I lived in that house for a year afterwards and would frequently see him sitting in my backyard or in the field behind my six feet privacy fence running in the unkempt space. Or staring directly up at my second story window. Then I moved from Colorado to Texas. I thought that would be the end of it. But I continued to see it. I was afraid at first of it, but over time grew used to catching sight of it. Most interactions were just catching him watching me. I never felt threatened, but he was always around. I've had multiple encounters where I wasn't the only one to see him either. I have had exes and my current spouse. Then best friends see him at 15 on their parents' almost 400 acres of property one night when we were having a sleepover. The next morning we went out to roam the fields we found a dead cow who had been born apart. Limbs scattered all over the pasture it was in. However, it wasn't supposed to even be there. There were no other cattle there. They were all over a mile away behind two three closed fences. I would put more here, but app slash phone are lagging due to length. I'm happy to answer questions or go more in depth on some of my encounters with him but most of it is just this watching from afar and dead animals showing up afterwards. I'm 30 now and moved back to Colorado last year and I have seen him since the move, but the visits are fewer and farther between than they were in Texas but I think part of that is because I live in a basement apartment now and try and limit my outside exposure due to C19, I'm high risk and am not outside nearly as often. I'd love to find out just what it is he is though. Maybe put my mind to rest. I decided to rent a cabin way up in northern Michigan for a week with my sister Tanya. My sister is a writer and this was also what she needed because she hadn't written in two weeks. So off we went. It was late May and still quite chilly, but we didn't care about the weather because we weren't there for sunbathing on the beach. The cottage was rustic but recently redone and it was located on a small pond but was surrounded by thick woods. Our cottage was the last one down a long dirt road. The cottage owner had put in several really nice long trails because if not then nobody was enjoying the woods. The first day we were unloading our luggage from the car and a young guy and his mom walked up the driveway. They introduced themselves and said they owned the house a little way down the road and they went for walks a few times a week for exercise past the cottage. The mother Linda mentioned that her husband had passed away a few years earlier and of course, I told her that I lost my husband Josh a few months earlier as well. Linda looked so sad for me but her son Brendan had a smirk on his face which really creeped me out. Linda seemed to notice this as well and said, okay let's leave these ladies to unpack and then said their goodbyes. I was unnerved by the way Brendan looked at me and I noticed he kept looking back at me as they walked away. On the first day, we just hung around the cabin. The next day I went for a walk alone so Tanya could get some writing done. I chose the path the owner said was the easiest. I had been walking for 10 minutes when I heard the sound of a small animal moving through the underbrush maybe something the size of a rabbit. So I stopped to listen and when I stopped the rustling stopped. I happened to glance back and I saw the shape of a human standing behind the thicket. I thought it was Brandon so I turned and kept walking. I was almost halfway and I'd see a tree about 30 feet in front of me but completely surrounded by the same thicket. I saw what again I perceived to be a naked Brandon. I couldn't see clearly because he was shrouded in darkness, but I saw him perched on the bottom limb of a tree just crouched there staring at me. I could see one hand holding the limb he was crouched on and his other arm was wrapped around the tree trunk. But now that I look back and I know what I was looking at. 
I can't believe I thought it was Brandon. A day or two later I was finally able to pull Tanya away from her laptop and we were on the porch to watch the sunset. We distinctly heard a wolf howl from at least the other side of the pond. We agreed it was really close, but we weren't too worried. We were more worried about the mother bears as we were told by Linda and the cabin owner that we needed to keep the bear spray on us at all times because the cubs were very young and the mothers were really protective. About 10 minutes later we heard an animal screaming. Oh my gosh, we were both saying and covering our ears. Tanya was saying this is too close to nature for me. Then Tanya went in to use the bathroom and when she came back she said what is that and pointed to the wood line. I saw the shrub shaking then an animal came out of the woods with a baby deer hanging from its mouth. The baby wasn't just a newborn. We looked at pictures showing various ages and it was probably two weeks old approximately. We are not country girls so please don't get on me for being wrong. Anyway, Tanya said, no, I don't want to see this and she went inside. I sat looking at this animal. I was fairly certain the fawn was already dead or I would have done something at least I'd like to think I would have. What? I don't know. But regardless I was trying to figure out what this animal was. It was walking into the open from the woods. It dropped the fawn from its mouth then it started sniffing it. I was fairly certain that this was a very large wolf with a case of the mange because its hair was thick around the neck like a lion's mane and it was thin to bear in spots. Its rear end was bald and I didn't even see a tail. I noticed it looked almost deformed because the back end sat way lower than the front. The animal seemed almost mesmerized by the fawn. It stared and sniffed at it, then it pushed it forward or over by using its nose. Then it picked it up by the mouth and started shaking it side to side viciously. Then it started biting into the midsection and when it lifted its head to chew you could clearly see intestines hanging out of its mouth. Now I believe I let out a sound at that point because it looked at me surprised and then ran about 10 feet to the large tree. It turned around and literally stood on its back legs. Oh my gosh. I realized this was the thing I saw up in the tree. I could clearly see the eyes were rusty colored and they were illuminated. They were glowing from the inside. It was starting to turn dusk. It just continued to stand there behind that tree. It seemed to be apprehensive a little but it was staring at me and then it would look towards the fawn. At one point I thought I saw it lift its lip and the whole muzzle started to vibrate like it was trying not to bare its teeth. Finally, it got down on all four feet and started walking slowly to the fawn. When it was almost there it swung its head in my direction and let out a low menacing growl. At the same time, it bared its teeth. This animal was at least 400 pounds. It could be even bigger but I'm afraid that the naysayers will call me a liar. This animal was at least three to four times as big as my German Shepherd. All the way around its head was huge. But what really terrified me was when it sneered at me and went down for the fawn. Its teeth were at least three inches long, sharp, and jagged. When it got to the fawn it picked it up in its mouth and took off at a fast slope. We didn't leave for walks after that. We barely left the cabin. When we did leave the last day we drove over to that tree and I got out and stood beside where it stood and I can say without a doubt it was well over six and a half to seven and a half feet tall. We drove past Linda's house and on second thought I asked Tanya to turn back around. I wanted to tell them what we saw. Linda was genuinely concerned and seemed shocked to hear what we saw. She appreciated that we thought enough to stop. When we got home we called the landlord and he said straight away that we were warned to carry bear spray so I just left it at that. I figured he thought we wanted our money back and that wasn't the case. So that's our story. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a Bigfoot. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature or even spirit possibly just a few nights ago and I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer to just what I had seen. I suppose I will start with the story now. It happened just a few nights ago when I was biking home from work, I worked the closing shifts for my local Walgreens so I get off work around 10.30. I live only 30 minutes away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights, so it's always pitch black when I'm going home. Well about 5 minutes-ish into the bike ride going home, I hit the beginning of where the street lights ended and darkness began, and like I always do, 
I pull out my phone and turn on the flashlight option so I can illuminate my way home, while only a few seconds after I turned it on I tilted it up more and froze because I saw this tall, skinny pale looking figure for a brief second before it fell onto all fours and like the wind was gone into the woods. Shortly after I started to paddle as fast as I could cause I had no clue what it was that I hate seeing, when I heard a low screech and whatever it was keeping pace with me hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly and didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later on I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles, like as if someone was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just of the pan blueberry waffles or pancakes, which didn't make sense to me as there are no buildings in the area where that scent was, so I figured perhaps whatever it was I had seen was possibly using scents to try to draw you into the fields or woods. Now I do know a few areas around that trail are supposedly haunted, there's a dinner theater that's not too far from it, and a supposed haunted water tower in the area as well, and a couple other places. But I still no matter what I think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. Couldn't be a deer because I have talked to people around the area and noon seen a deer ever in the area, and besides it was standing on two feet when I saw it like it was a humanoid. Couldn't have been any other wildlife cause the only wildlife I have spotted are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anyone has had something similar or may know a possible rationalized explanation for what I could have seen. I am sharing this story due to the request of another Redditor. This encounter took place in the winter of 2016 in Davies County, Indiana. It was around 8 o'clock and very dark outside. I was out feeding my goats, the goat shed was about 300 yards away from my home. To get to the shed I had to cross two small fields and walk along a narrow path through the woods. These woods border an Indiana naval facility. After I had finished I began to walk back. I had crossed one field and was about halfway through the narrow path when I started to hear rustling in the underbrush. All I had with me was a little flashlight that only shined about 10 feet in front of me. I was almost to the end of the path when I spotted something. It was on all fours with a bony frame, elongated limbs, and pale skin. While the first part of that description sounds pretty generic, it did seem to have a long and highly flexible neck. Not long after I noticed it it noticed me and bolted down the path. It ran, almost scuttling into the second field. This field had a small hill in the center this thing fled and disappeared over one side. I ran as fast as I could around the other side of the small hill and zigzagged back to my house where I quickly locked all of my doors. This thing was terrifying, but it seemed watchful more than anything, for now. This happened somewhere between 2007 to 2011. Summer or fall. Clear sky with a full moon if I remember right. It wasn't too long after sunset. My friend and I were walking through a cemetery on the edge of town. As we were walking down the main lane through the cemetery, something came running from the gate and passed us on our left. My friend had laughed and asked if I had heard that, and I stopped walking and responded that no, but I had seen it. As the thing had passed between headstones I caught a look. Looked like a pale, emaciated humanoid that was running on all fours. It had no hair at all that I could see and I did not get a look at the face. It was moving far faster than any person running on hands slash feet should have been able to. My friend and I just stayed frozen there and waited for another friend to come and get us because we were too scared to move. It continued to circle us, as we could hear it moving around. It never seemed threatening. If anything it seemed curious slash scared of us. But who knows? I do know that it was not a coyote or a stray dog. I never saw the face, but I did see the head, it did not have a muzzle. There was no tail, either. It definitely didn't have fur, it had pale, almost bluish skin and I remember I could make out the ribs from where I was standing. Forgive me if this is a hot mess of a post, I was up all night researching this thing and when I did fall asleep I didn't sleep well. I was driving down the highway one night around 3 a.m. heading home from work. Usually I would only pass one car every few minutes. Per usual I saw lone headlights coming over the hill towards me on the other side of the highway. As they got within about 300 yards or so they abruptly turned almost at a 90 degree angle towards the woods. 
I was confused at first due to the darkness, thinking it was a wild teenager taking an exit at high speed. The headlights came bulleting out of the woods straight over the highway and towards me. So I slammed the brakes and the car flipped and spun around upside down and landed against the guard rail on my right. I was stopped at this point and ran out to help. A man, bloody, crawled out of his upside down car and all he said was don't call the police. He pulled himself over the guard rail and stumbled down towards the wood line and disappeared. So I got in my car and went home. It was a very hot summer night. I was coming back from Virginia Beach, and I and my girlfriend at the time were together by the time I got to Mississippi. I had left Virginia early in the morning in the car. By the time I got to Mississippi, Highway 59, it was already close to midnight, or maybe one in the morning. Highway 59 in eastern Mississippi is very, very lonely. You just have Highway 59 with the traffic going that way and the traffic coming this way, and you've got tall trees on both sides and nothing else. Maybe you might have a little rest area or a little mom and pop gas station every 15 or 20 miles. But in between there is nothing. As I drove that night, I was tired and I was on the road from the morning, since the state of Virginia. My girlfriend was already asleep and my little boy was in the back seat. Because I'm a night person, I didn't have a problem staying awake. As I drove down that highway, on the side, I saw a man. A man walking, walking kinda fast, looking down. Very tall, loping man that I thought was wearing a coat. I thought, what in the hell is he doing here, first of all, why in the hell is he wearing a damn coat on this hot Mississippi night? I said, honey, I saw a man walking all alone. I need to help him. She said, are you crazy? I said, no, I'm not going to offer him a ride. I'm going to give him some money so that way as soon as he gets to the next town he can get a room or buy himself a nice hot meal or whatever. So I put the car in reverse to make sure that I wouldn't get ahead. I was already about 2,000 feet ahead of him but I was going in reverse and he was closer to the woods. He was actually on the shoulder of the highway. I stop the car and he stops. He looks at me and I notice a massive man and my eyes are trying to adjust to the darkness of the night and I said, sir, sir. I would like to offer you some money, sir, so that way you could rent a room in the next town. He looks at me, and I realized I was not looking at a man. He made a loud, loud screeching sound that even today my ears hurt and then he ran into the woods. I was so horrified. I got in that car, and I said, honey. I didn't say anything else. I put the car in first gear and I drove 85 miles an hour and my girlfriend was like, what happened? What happened? Honey, what did he do to you? I said, honey, it wasn't a man, it was Sasquatch. I just had an encounter with Bigfoot. Later on, I realized that there have been stories dating back to the 1800s and 1700s about the Mississippi Monkey Man stories passed on by the slave Indians, people from back then about the Mississippi Monkey Man. I was stationed in the Panhandle near Pensacola. I was in charge of a team of about 10 guys taking part in an exercise. We were playing the bad guys for the exercise, and on that night our job was just maneuvering. Mostly walking and driving around pretend villages. Anyways, we grabbed our gear for the night and went out to an informal staging area to wait around for us to get called into the village. Being a group of young military guys with nothing to do, we started messing around. Driving in circles and up and down the nearby dirt trails in our trucks, talking crap on the radios, looking around with our NVGS, etc., because why not? We spot an SUV parked down one trail which was a bit odd since we were on the military range at the time, but not crazy since we weren't near any of the sensitive or dangerous parts. I drive up next to the SUV slowly and the guy sitting shotgun, with NVGS, says there's some weird person sitting in it. He hands me the NVGS and I look over and holy hell that person was terrifying. They were in the back, on the driver's side. Super tight skin, crazy sunken eyes, thin lanky hair. At first just staring straight ahead, but they suddenly turned to look at us and I booked it out of there. I practically threw the NVGS at the guy next to me. I don't know why, but I felt one of the deepest feelings of fear I'd ever had. 
Literally, the only times that were worse were times where I genuinely thought I was about to die. We drive back to where the other guys were and tell them about it. Of course they think we're messing with them, but eventually we convince them to follow us and check it out. So now there's a convoy of three trucks holding ten guys, we roll past to let truck two get next to the SUV and only a few seconds go by and the radio goes wild with them yelling go go. We haul us out of there and all agree to find a new informal staging point to park at. The rest of the night we have with each other about the descent woman watching us or waiting for one of us to walk off alone and just generally joking around, but I did notice that no one wanted to go piss by themselves. Anytime someone had to go, suddenly a few other guys chimed in too. The rational explanation is that it was some drifter in the SUV crashing for the night, probably at least a little high, tired, and confused as f about the trucks creeping up on them then driving off real fast. I live in Connecticut, in the middle of the woods. My dad is not the type to believe in any kind of supernatural phenomena and he's a pretty logical person. Some background, a few years ago a friend of mine who lives nearby saw a crawler in his backyard. It was terrifying for him, he was shaking as he told me about his experience. He's not the type to make up stories and I could tell he wasn't trying to bull us me. My dad and I were discussing creatures in the woods a couple nights ago raccoons, deer, etc., when I mentioned cryptids. My dad then proceeded to tell me a story of him and his friend spotting one on his friend's security camera. He gave me an exact detailed description of a crawler. Every detail was accurate to both my friend's description from that story years back and from stories I've read online. I explained what crawlers are and told him of my friend's experience. He's been freaked out ever since, understandably so. He hadn't heard of crawlers before I told him but says that's definitely what he saw. Initially he thought a friend or the camera company was playing a prank but whatever he saw was definitely real. He says whenever him or any of his friends are alone at the site of the sighting they feel totally unnerved like they're being watched or stalked. Wanted to post about it just need to say, for the record, I do believe in these things. Super interesting phenomena and although I myself am a skeptic you can't deny that there's something out there. Thanks for reading. I have recently learned what skinwalkers are, and it completely made sense of an event that happened to me as a child that I had previously completely blocked out of my brain. I don't believe I was targeted in this scenario, but I do know that this absolutely happened, I was not dreaming, etc. I was about 11 years old, visiting my mom's extended family in California with my parents and siblings. I had been there before, and I always slept alone on an air mattress in the living room slash sunroom, which had a greenhouse-like glass paint wall to the front of the house, facing the street. My air mattress was tucked behind a couch, so it's not like anyone could look inside and see me. The house was also about 75-100 feet back from the road, with a large gate in the front, so I didn't feel exposed at all in that front room. It was a usual summer evening, and everyone settled into bed. I remember that I used to like to stay up late playing games on my Nintendo DS or iPod, especially on vacation. I had been on my iPod getting a little sleepy when I started to hear strange rustling noises coming from outside. I sat up and peered outside, but couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. The road outside was dimly lit by a streetlight, so any animals I would have seen. I figured it was probably an animal in a bush somewhere, so I put my iPod down and tried to go to sleep though my eyes were still pinned to the window out of curiosity. A few quiet minutes pass, and I convince myself that it was nothing. The minute I lay back down, something across the street caught my eye and I darted back up. Completely silently, I saw what appeared to be two coyote-like figures, only they were mainly walking on their hind legs, which looked much bigger than their front ones. They appeared to be six or seven feet tall. There was absolutely no noise at all. I could not believe what I was seeing. One of them turned to look towards me, so I ducked my head down behind the couch. After a few moments, I slowly peeked again. They continued walking the same direction until I couldn't see them anymore. So I finally went to bed. At the time I don't think I was super freaked out, I figured it must have been some sort of animal. I never asked anyone about it, though, and only as an adult did I realize that there are no such animals like the ones I saw. I know coyotes exist and are abundant in California, 
but they do not walk on their hind legs and they're certainly not seven feet tall. I am now convinced that I saw two skinwalkers that night. I am not the person who saw the creature. I am reporting what coworker has told me. I believe what he says. My coworker and his son were archery hinting in Northeast Oregon. They walked to the end of a ridge overlooking a small sparsely forested valley. As he was looking over the valley for game he saw a tree, which had fallen and was leaning over another fallen tree. He said the tree was pointed up at about a 30 degree angle. He saw that something had just moved the tree, he said it was bouncing pretty good. He figured a bear was trying to get at grubs that sometimes live in rotting wood. He and his son decided to make their way closer to the tree to catch a glimpse of the animal making the tree move. As they were making their way towards for the tree they heard something behind them. The noise came from where they just were. He turned around to see what made the noise. As he turned he saw what he thought was another hunter about 60 yards to their right walking across an open hillside. My coworker blew on his cow call to get the figure's attention. The figure totally ignored him. He blew on the call again but still the figure ignored him. At this point he was annoyed that another would not acknowledge him, so he decided to walk in the figure's direction. He said as he walked towards the figure it bolted and ran into the timber. My coworker ran to where the figure went into the timber. He figures the figure was only 30 yards from him when he stopped where he last saw it. The figure then ran, my coworker ran after it. He said he could hear it running through the brush and trees. Whatever it was it sounded heavy. He figured he ran about 50 yards after it. When he stopped running the thing was at least 100 yards ahead of him and still running. It was making a lot of noise going through the brush and trees. At first he didn't realize what he saw. He figured it was Hunter in full camouflage. Then he realized the Hunter wasn't carrying a bow or any other type of hunting equipment. And he said there was no way a man could move that fast through that kind of brush and trees. He also says it made too much noise as it was running. After he realized it was a Bigfoot he and his son went back to look for tracks or any other evidence. There were no actual tracks, just torn up pine needles and busted limbs. The only other thing they found was a semi-fresh dead elk that looked like it had been eaten on by some animal. We have talked about this incident numerous times. He believes what he saw was a Bigfoot. He figures the Bigfoot that made the down tree move. It most likely winded him or saw him and it circled around behind him and his son. He said he had just relieved himself before he saw the tree moving. He thinks the Bigfoot circled back around him, got a good smell of the urine, and decided to leave the area. Since he and his son were in full camouflage, he thinks the Bigfoot didn't see him as it walked across the open hillside. Once he moved the Bigfoot saw him and tried to get out of sight. It was blackish brown in color. This is a second event and was told to me by another coworker who was hunting in the same general area. I'm not sure of the year. It was within a year of the other coworker's sighting. According to my coworker he and a friend were in their tent trying to sleep. He said at around midnight he and his friend were awoken by a loud noise that started out as a low growl and gained pitch until it sounded like a scream. He said the noise would happen in about 20 second intervals. He said whatever was making the noise was making its way past the camp. He guesses it was between 50 and 75 yards away from the camp, skirting the campsite. It continued making the noise until it got about 200 yards away, then it stopped making the noise. My coworker said it sounded like whatever was making the noise was mad that someone was in its territory and was trying to scare them away. They were the only people in the area. The nearest groups of hunters were camped about five miles away. These two individuals would like to be kept confidential. I will ask the individual who saw and chased the Bigfoot if he will let me give you his name. I have every reason to believe he saw Bigfoot. Neither person I talked to notified anybody about what they encountered. In fact, the individual who saw the Bigfoot didn't say anything to anyone for about a year. I will get the exact location and date of the first sighting and relay it to you later. I'm up north and this is northern Michigan and anybody who knows anything about Michigan, once you get past the center of Michigan, it's pretty much all wilderness up until you get to Canada. 
So my wife's family has a cabin probably three hours north of where we live, in a place called Vanderbilt, a very small little village. Their place is way out in the sticks. There's one street. And the street is maybe a mile long and there are six houses on the whole street. So it's a small cabin and it sits on maybe close to 70 acres, but it's all wooded, just totally wooded. So the next neighbor is close, but then after that, you know, you're probably about a half mile before you get to the next person. So we're up there on four wheelers. We go up there, take the four wheelers, take a bunch of gas, and we ride. Like the whole family. So this one time, I don't know what in the hell possessed me to do this, but 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock up there is not like it is when you're in a city because there are no street lights and you're totally in the forest. So I've ridden it. I have been going up there for damn near 15 to 20 years by this time and had not seen anything, had not heard anything. There was no indication that anything sketchy at all would be going on. So I get my daughters, two of my daughters. So we jump on our wheels and my thing is this is like you take a main road down probably a mile and then you turn and you go on a dirt road and then you take that road around. Then you're going to the wood and then there are things called two tracks and this. It's kind of a place where there's enough area for one vehicle or one four wheeler or whatever and then that's where you hit all the trails. So as we're on the main road or whatever, it's still pretty open because it's a paved road and it's two lanes, one going each way. It's pretty wide open and it's not that dark, you know, but the lights of the four-wheelers are on. So we go we make the left and we get on the dirt road. This is a main kind of what you consider a main road there. It's not technically inside the wood where the two-track is so it's a place where you could drive a truck or a car whatever. So we make those first couple of turns going back there before even getting really into the woods. In the two tracks, it's like it went from 5 to 6 o'clock to midnight immediately. I'm like, oh no, this is a bad idea. I started to feel really funny, so I stopped my daughters and I'm like, nope, turn around. I allow both of them to go in front of me and turn around and I turn around last and I tell them, nope, just keep going right on back to the cabin. So we're on like, we're not even 5 to 10 minutes from the cabin. So we turn around and we start heading back to the cabin and as we head back and I'm in back there and they're in front, both of them. I look to my left and here's what's really weird and kind of how I don't know how your mind works when you see something that you just, you don't really know what you're seeing. Your mind can't process it. I look over and the only thing I can think of is just two people on horses because that's the only thing that my mind could process, a human figure being that tall. Somebody would have to be sitting on top of a horse. That was the first thing my mind processed and they're just standing still, not moving one muscle. Two of them. One is clearly taller than the other by almost a foot. So I'm looking at them. I don't see the back part of the horses at all but their hair is so long it's like a horse's mane but it's all over and they're just standing there. I just freaked out because I'm back here in the dark and now my mind is playing tricks on me. So I keep going. We zoom back to the cabin. It's probably 10 p.m., 15 relatives were there. They're all sitting around the fire outside, you know, drinking, whatever, telling stories, having a good time and we got like five dogs with us because it's three or four families. I think I had two dogs at the time. So we get back and I'm sitting around, of course, telling the story about how that was the worst idea ever because we turned two corners and we were in complete darkness and how I would never ever do anything that stupid again. We're sitting around and my back is to the cabin and I'm facing the woods. All of a sudden, all the dogs started to go completely bonkers. They're running around in circles, peeing on themselves, barking. I mean barking, but totally scared. No bark of aggression at all. I mean absolutely totally, they're all going so crazy that everybody corrals their dogs and they had to put their dogs in the cabin and the dogs are still going crazy. They just will not stop. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? And my dog, rest in peace, Nala, she's right next to me, but she's just going in circles, going in circles, going in circles, and I'm like, what's wrong? Relax. So I look straight ahead in the woods and what I see, and this is how I processed it, I see glowing yellow eyes, two sets. One was probably 11 feet tall and one was probably 12 feet tall and the only reference I have is I coach basketball. 
I coached basketball for 20 years, so I know what 10 feet tall looks like, and I know one was 11 feet and one was 12 feet. So I say to myself, this must be two owls in the trees. Wow, owls. Their eyes would be like, you know, close together if it's an owl. These are this far apart, uses fingers to show width, and so I just started to look and I see them blink. I see one of the sets of eyes blink and then it dawns on me what the dogs are afraid of and what they saw and I believe that those same two Sasquatch that I had just seen when we rode around the corner coming back. Those two had covered the distance in lovely minutes to get where they were and they were just outside of our fire and everything else but they were legit right there watching us and that's why the dogs went absolutely berserk because they also saw the same two Sasquatch that I saw up north in Vanderbilt, Michigan.